introduce myself real quick. Hey, everybody. My name is Laura Joseph, owner of the Animal Behavior Center. <clears throat> we are an international educational center where we do um, we show everybody our live streaming services uh, uh, through our subscriptions. We're an international educational center teaching people all over the world. Hey, everybody. Good morning. About using living, loving and learning with animals using applied behavior analysis and positive reinforcement. And we do that through our live streaming services. Um, and this one we bring to you free every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Eastern. Hey, everybody. Good to see you guys on here. Um, I see a couple of Heathers and Sean and Tim. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, so, hey, Jennifer. Hey, Bobby. Thanks for uh, joining us again this morning. Uh, this morning, we have a special guest, Laura Zitzelberger, Director of Operations at Nature's Nursery, and she's going to be bringing on a couple of special guests this morning as well for you guys to see. Um, but before we get start started, um, like I, I like to do a recap of the following week or the past week. Um, we've had quite a bit of activity here the last week, and um, I have um, Quincy, our Rottweiler, in here with us this morning. Good morning, everybody. Hey, Bettina. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. This broadcast will be an hour. I'm going to do a recap real quick of the past week and show you some things we've been working on. Um, with that being said, we have our... Um, Every year we do one, maybe two events um, where we open our doors here locally to the public. We are located in Northwest Ohio, right outside of Toledo. We're in Sylvania, Ohio. And um, we have uh, the director of the Indonesian Parrot Project flying in uh, to spend a weekend with us. Good morning, Terry. Uh, the second weekend in May. And we'll be doing a cocktails and canvas fundraiser for the Indonesian Parrot Project when Bonnie Zimmerman flies in. Uh, we're going to try to figure out a way to make that something that people can attend via a live stream. Um, this is a fundraiser um, and Bonnie will be talking about a lot of different things, including the smuggling and the concerns with smuggling and poaching within Indonesia. Good morning, Sonia. Hey, everybody. I see. Hey, Brianna. I see a lot of uh, members of the Animal Behavior Center on here and those in our projects. So let's go ahead and get started with the recap of this past week. This past week has been kind of tough for a lot of us um, in many different ways. Uh, those of you that follow the work that we do know that we do a lot of work um, helping different organizations and uh, zoos, uh, shelters, um, wildlife rehab centers, <clears throat> Um, this past week, good morning, Eva, we took, um, we were consulting with a mutilation case. Um, there's Quincy. Um, I asked you if you wanted to stay in here with me. <laughs> um, we took in, um, um, a mutilation case, which is, it's hard for everybody to, it's hard to see. It's hard to work with. Um, and um, once it was determined that it was not medical, it was a behavior issue. Um, they called me in uh, to start intervening and we put a behavior modification plan in place immediately. Quincy, you're getting all caught up in my technology here. We put a behavior modification plan in place immediately. And um, part of that had to deal with, uh, this is Abby. She's, he, he's probably about uh, 17 years old, we were told. I guesstimated him to be anywhere between 10 to 15, but uh, mutilation cases can be tough because um, they're multifaceted. And uh, we put a behavior modification plan in place and decided it was in the best interest of this bird to um, be moved to somebody, to, an, uh, to a location that could give pretty intense um, detail to care and following that behavior modification plan and play, uh, that behavior modification plan. So um, I ended up reaching out to some of the people in the Parrot Project and a couple of people came to mind that could help me in getting this bird transferred 
to where it can it can um, have the detail and care that it needs. So Shelly Hostetler came in and uh, picked up the bird and the bird Abby is now in her care and Shelly and I are working <clears throat> numerous times a day throughout the day in um, working with Abby and I'm happy to say that um, we did put a protect or Shelly did put a protective collar on Abby and uh, for temporarily and here's the key in working with any behavior modification plan is if you're going to use something like um, a collar to help protect the bird. Um, Shelly said she needed that wound to dry out and this was after the bird had already been seen by a veterinarian here locally. <clears throat> um, if you're going to use something like that at the same time you need to be using positive reinforcement and um, Shelly is incorporating uh, replacement behaviors. I had suggested foraging and training. She has started both of those immediately and I'm happy to say Shelly sent me a video yesterday. Abby's collar is now off. So, uh, but not permanently for, for short amounts of time while she is um, focusing on redirecting and in, implementing a replacement behavior. So Shelly is on here this morning's live stream and I just want to say kudos to the awesome work you're doing Shelly. Um, like I said Shelly and I are collaborating numerous times a day. She's being very detailed in everything she's implementing and I'm guiding her along the way in any questions she has. So kudos to you. Um, with that being said, spring is here, and that's going to be the topic of today's uh, Coffee with the Critters, um, spring babies. But um, one of the things we're working on here is it's time that the weather is getting warmer. We're moving animals outside. We're starting to get them going on different outings. So where we begin training our animals to walk loosely on a leash is in the house in the middle of the winter to get them ready for the park when the spring comes. Because as you guys hear me say, when you start training an animal to walk at the park is not necessarily at the park. So um, these guys have their brilliant canine harnesses on and I will be interviewing Terry James um, soon because this is an ergonomic harness um, designed specifically. She's a previous horse trainer and it's just a fascinating story and a fascinating way to see how these harnesses work. Uh, we're interviewing her in level one and um, she's providing a discount to our level one members for these harnesses, but I will be also bringing her on live um, here in Coffee with the Critters, I believe it's in June, to show uh, the thought process behind these harnesses. It's pretty fascinating. <clears throat> so because the mutilation case has been taking up a lot of our time, um, and rightfully so, <clears throat> I don't have a lot of other updates to bring on for this week, but one of the things we're doing here, here's our volunteer, Lindsay Douglas, doing some awesome work with Rocky the Moluccan Cockatoo. She has never picked him up before and here she is picking him up. Um, spring is here um, <laughs> and with spring brings a lot of other behavior, not necessarily issues but concerns so we're focusing a lot of our time with that. We just did a live stream in our level two membership which is for professionals. Um, on Monday we did a live stream focusing on um, seasonal changes in working with raptors. We did that in level two this week and it went pretty fabulous, but this is Willie, the 16 year old turkey vulture here for training from Nature's Nursery. And um, spring is in the air here too. Mm. So anybody that cares for <laughs> trains, um, a turkey vulture ambassador knows exactly what I'm talking about when working with these behaviors. Um, so there she is. We just redirect behavior. Um, with that being said, I believe it is time to bring on Laura Zitzelberger. Um, she is director of operations at Nature's Nursery <clears throat> here 
is their website and you can find more about Nature's Nursery on their website, natures-nursery.org. This is an organization that I volunteered for over eight years and uh, that's how I met Laura. And um, a lot of interesting work and we have a lot of fun. So let me go ahead and bring Laura on here. There she is. <laughs> hey, Laura. Good to Hi. see you. Just uh, finishing up feeding baby squirrels. Yeah. So. We, we did a test on this last night, and I got to get a sneak peek of the feeding of the baby squirrels. There you go. So <laughs> um, this is what, one of three or four? One of three that were all systematically brought up to the house by a cat. So... <gasps> Can you watch those cats outside? So, so what would you say? What about the cats? I outside? They, these were um, all probably from the same nest. The cat must have figured out where the nest was and systematically brought all three up to the house. So that's how we ended up with them. Yeah. So that I know there's a lot of controversy out there about <clears throat> people leaving their house cats outside running around. This right. is one of the concerns, right? Right. Yeah. And there's, you know, there's, you know, sadly, all those cats you see outside are due to, you know, humans not being responsible. Uh, they're not a natural part of the process, but they are out there. So, yeah, there's that that balance between uh, what to do with them. But all I can say is I encourage people to please not let your cats outside. Um, you know, the, the the feral cat population is a whole whole different topic. But, you know, it's if we can keep our pet cats inside, that's the best thing. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, so with that being said, what this was uh, somebody's house cat that brought in all these babies. Yeah. Yes, it was their cat. So. OK. OK. So then what happens? Then they call their local wildlife rehabilitation yep. center. Mm -hmm. Right. So they called. Yeah. So they called us and when they called us the first time. Uh, they just had one. And by the time we returned their call, they had three. So um, brought so in the rest of them. Yes. Yeah, so I said, well, how about you keep a cat inside? <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We'll yeah. see if they listen. So, yeah. um, um, as this is spring, and I know you guys get overloaded with wild babies, um, can you give us a couple instances of what happens? Yes. I'd say the biggest phone call right now, um, and anybody who's uh, – answering our phones right now is probably in their sleep saying, put it back, put it back. Um, they is the, that's the baby bunnies. You know, we're getting lots of calls on baby bunnies and you know, the big message I guess I'd have to say for anybody is there's no safe place to be a rabbit. There's no safe place to make your nest. So a lot of people will say, well, why did they choose my yard? I have a dog. Um, because maybe the next yard doesn't have a dog, but they might have more of a frequency of, raccoons or fox or hawks or owls. And so there's no safe place for a rabbit to make her nest. And, and it could be, uh, why do, um, why did you choose to build your house on around my nest? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so, you know, our, we spend a lot of time on the phone explaining to people what's normal and what's not normal. And it's perfectly normal that they'll make their nest out in the middle of the yard without any cover. They don't dig a burrow. It's just a very shallow divot in the ground. They pull out some of their own hair and some of the surrounding grass and line the nest and cover it with that. And you will almost never see the mother at the nest. She feeds these babies within about five minutes and she does it two to three times a day. And it's almost always after dark. So people panic when they don't see the mother. Is that to protect the babies? Yeah, they don't want to attract, attract predators to the nest, but she's nearby. She's watching. Um, so, um, you know, we we have lots of suggestions we can give to people to mark the nest to make sure she's coming back. OK, so um, the key here is sorry, I've got a Rottweiler that's taking <laughs> I, that, that's, I, I locked all my cats out of the room. So. <laughs> I asked her, do you want to be in here? Because you're going to be shut in here with me for the next hour. Um, Okay, so I guess one of the, so people find these babies, prob, and I remember finding a nest of babies, this was years ago when I was in college, 
Um, so I found the nest and I was like, oh no, I have to get these to safety. Well, they probably already in safety. Yeah, exactly. You know, it, you know, there's a lot of rabbits out there. They're doing something right. So, uh, um, you know, and people will, you know, there's the old wives tale. Well, my, my kids got into the nest and they handled the babies. That's fine. Put them back. Um, you know, I've had people bring us baby bunnies and if I've had a nest in my yard that was about the same age, I've stuck those babies in there and checked on them over the next few days and mama's taking care of all of them. She, they're hardwired to raise their babies and they're not going to give up on them simply because somebody touched them or because the dog dug up the nest. So, you know, there's, there's also every um, circumstance is different. So I always hate to give a blanket. You know, we joke that the, the rule with bunnies is put them back. But, you know, there's circumstances where they do need to come in um, or maybe some of them need to come in. If the dog got into the nest and pawed some of them and they're injured, those should come in. But the healthy ones can still stay. So um, <clears throat> how long does it how long should people expect that nest of babies to be there? How long does it take them to? They're pretty quick, whereas these baby squirrels have probably just gotten their eyes open and they're about a month old. Okay. Baby bunnies are almost on their own by the time they're a month old. So they get their eyes open at around, you know, 12 days or so. And they they are still pretty small when they're old enough to be out of the nest, eating on their own, maybe still nursing from the mother occasionally. So, you know, from start to finish, they're probably going to have maybe a month of those bunnies being in the nest. And, you know, we can give them suggestions on if they need to let their dogs out what to do. You know, they can cover it with a, a milk crate or something like that. Put a brick on top if it's a bigger dog that might try to get to them. Every time the dogs let out, do that. The dogs out. Yeah, it takes a little effort on people's parts. But, you know, we've we've uh, over the years, we've gotten more and more firm about we're not going to take healthy babies just because it's an inconvenience to have them in your yard. So we really try to talk to people as much as we can about their specific circumstance. Yeah. And because um, nature's nursery, along with most other wildlife rehab centers, you guys are nonprofit. Yeah. So. Um, when these people bring these bunnies, perfectly healthy bunnies into you, now you've got to come up with the funds. Exactly. And it's, it's, it's more than what you would think um, because it's not just feeding them. It's um, having the proper medical care if they start to get bloated or start to get diarrhea. Um, the formula that we use is not just puppy or kitten formula. We special order for the species um, and in big 20 gallon buckets of powder uh, that cost hundreds of dollars. So it's, um, and then, and then there's having pre-release cages for them and the volunteers and the staff to take care of them until they're doing well enough to go back out into the wild. Yeah. Um, something, what, what else I was going to say. Um, so with the, okay. So what, what do you go through if you're working with uh, rehabbing them. What's the process that you work through? Because you're obviously handling them. Oh, I know something else I wanted to talk to you about was people who try to intervene and feed on their own. Yes. It, it, and, and I've seen that just from my time being out at nature's nursery, mm -hmm. you know, I'll let you give the advice <laughs> because a lot of these people are bringing it in, just feeding it, you know, different foods that are doing a lot of harm. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, I just did a post on our um, Facebook page about how important it is not to feed something if you find it. Because whether it's a baby animal or an injured adult animal, if their body temperature is low, if they're dehydrated, if they're underweight or emaciated, even if you fed them the right things, the energy that was going to keeping their body alive is now going to digesting this food and it takes away from all the other organs. And so you can kill an animal by kind with kindness that way. So, you know, and a lot of times people will be upset because they'll bring us an animal that perked up overnight with them because they fed it. And five days down the road, it might die because what of they the results of what happened there. It's called refeeding syndrome. And so it's really important that animals not get nutrition until their body is ready for it again. Um, so that's a big issue. The other issue is most people, you know, we took in 2,880 animals last year. Wow. You know, even if we wanted to, we don't have the time 
to dote on you know these these babies the way somebody from the public might and that doting on them is another death sentence for them because if they're too comfortable around your pet dog or around people when it gets released it's not going to behave in a normal manner and it's going to get get itself into trouble yeah there's those are some uh punk rocker uh, Cooper's Hawk babies that uh, got soaking wet uh, when their nest fell down a couple of years ago. Yeah, I was what I was like, I know those are hawks. I just don't yep. know what. Yeah. Are. Um, so, OK, um, what are I mean, I know we talked about um, ducks before mm -hmm. in the past. Be, do, can you elaborate on that, like what sure. people might be seeing, what's normal, what's not normal. Yeah, we're getting ready to get start getting the phone calls that I like the least. And that's the mother duck and her babies that are getting ready to cross Monroe Street um, or the, you know, I-475. And, you know, we have to explain to people that, you know, literally we get dozens of those calls a day. We can't rush out and try to rescue and trying to rescue those sick in those circumstances can sometimes turn deadly because when we try to intervene, mom might fly off, the babies all start to scatter and do go out into traffic. There used to be a mother duck up at Westgate Shopping Center that for many years in a row would lay her eggs in one of the planters at Westgate. And when those babies hatched, they had to then cross Secor. And most years they all got across. Um, but for those that aren't local that are watching this, the streets that we're talking about in Toledo, Ohio, oh, yes. and Monroe are extremely busy. Yes. And so ducks make their nests away from water. That's the other thing that people panic about. They, there's no water anywhere around. Sometimes they'll have to walk a mile to get to the water they want to go to. And But you have to let them do what they're going to do. As much as we are here to help kind of balance things out between humans and wildlife. Some things are things that they have to learn. And so if we intervene and rescue, next year she's gonna do the exact same thing. And if that's a bad thing for her to do, she's not gonna learn from that. And these animals learn from year to year what works for them as far as their nests. And so, yes, they, them they make their nests away from water. That's one of the things that people don't realize. They um, the mother, they don't, if they find a nest in their yard, if they look out in the, their mulch up by their house and there's a duck nesting there, they don't have to put out food and water for her. Um, you know, keep in mind that out in the wild, nobody sets out a bowl of food and water for them. And if you do that, you might actually draw in predators that will then raid the nest. So up against your house is not half a bad place for her to make her nest because there's a lot of human activity and there might be less, less predator activity. So feel free to give us a call. And again, it, it just, they'll lay 12 to 14 eggs and they don't start incubating until that egg, last egg is laid. And then it's gonna be 28 days or so and those babies are gonna hatch and she's gonna start walking with them and taking them to wherever it is she wants to take them. So your advice for the baby ducks is just leave it alone. Yeah, leave it alone. And again, you know, always call us. You know, there's circumstances where we get involved darn sewer grates out there. They need to redesign those because mom walks across the sewer grate and then the babies blah, 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 all fall down into the sewer. And then we get phone calls where we then are coordinating with the city to remove the sewer grate and trying to get the babies out of the sewer to get them reunited with mom. Um, there's times when maybe mom and all the babies made it across the road and one baby held back too long and didn't make it across and is stuck on the other side of the road. So somebody might find one single baby. If that's the case, then it may need to come in to a rehabilitation center. But in the meantime, what most people do is they hold it and they love it and they kiss it and they hug it. And in the case of, say, a baby goose, a gosling, if it still is good and wild, you can't do this with ducks, but with, with geese, you can sometimes get them adopted into another family. So we can go and find another, you know, Goose, who's got babies about the same age, and get this one in with hers as long as people haven't handled it too much and made it act different from everybody else. Good, so, good information. All, all different circumstances. Um, so I'm just going to show um, this picture. Hmm. Is a bunch of baby bunnies. 
Yes. Um, when was this? Uh, this was from last year, and it, you can see that they're all different sizes in this. Um, this was probably, you know, partway through the day, the bunnies that we had taken in. Um, and then what we do from this point um, is get them all weighed, get them into batches according to their weight, and then we tube feed them based on their body weight. And so litters don't necessarily stay together. That's why um, if somebody brings an animal to nature's nursery, we give them a case number so they can call and check on it if it's an injured animal. With baby animals, we don't do that because I can tell you that if uh, one of those was your bunny that you found there, I wouldn't know which one was which by the end of the day. So um, we don't mark them with colors or anything like that. We just get them into batches according to their body weight and their condition. Good. Um, I wanted to bring up an instance that um, <clears throat> where I, um, hey, thanks, Tim. Tim just posted your address. Um, <laughs> the PO box, yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, so if people have questions, call their local wildlife rehabilitation center. Absolutely, yes. Um, and there's a lot of good rehabilitation. Ohio is very lucky. There's a lot of good rehabilitation centers and um, individuals who are licensed. It's really important, though, to to call somebody who is licensed. You know, a lot of times we see posts on these lost animal sites and on the garage sale sites. Um, you know, sadly, we've even seen people trying to sell baby bunnies for five dollars a piece from a nest they found in their yard. Okay. Uh, but um, it's really important not to just give them to anybody who's willing to take them uh, because they say they've got some experience there's a reason there's a licensing process for what we do. And believe me, we have to jump through a lot of hoops. There's a lot of paperwork we have to fill out. Um, we're licensed by the state to take care of mammals and the state and the federal government to take care of birds. So what people need to also keep in mind is if you find a nest of baby bunnies and you want to raise them yourself, uh, you're breaking a state law. If you do that with a nest of baby robins that falls out of the tree, you're breaking federal law. And the reason for that is they don't want people exposing themselves to disease and parasites from wildlife that they don't know anything about. And they don't want wild animals being raised improperly to survive back out in the wild. There's a lot of information to know. Um, I know I've gone to the Ohio Wildlife Rehabilitators Association several times and the international. And when I sit in and listening to a lot of reasons why these laws are in place, it's important. It's for a purpose. It's not right. just to say constantly say no there's yeah. underlying reasons and one of them and this is in my area of expertise this would be yours is for somebody that doesn't or that has some experience taking in some of these animals it's important where they be released and how they be released correct absolutely so you know we we keep uh, a list of possible release sites for a lot of different animals anything uh, certain species have to go back to the same county and township that they came from so that we're being very diligent about not potentially spreading disease. Um, <clears throat> then, you know, with adult animals, a lot of times we're trying to get them back to the same area they came from because their success rate is going to be so much better. Baby animals, then we just try to find appropriate places, but we don't release gray squirrels where there aren't currently gray squirrels living. We don't want to start up populations unnaturally, so we only get them to places where we know there's already a population. Um, so we take into a lot of, a lot of things into consideration. We don't want to overpopulate an area. Um, we don't want to take an animal and make it somebody else's problem. Um, so there's yeah, a lot that goes into that too. I'm trying to extinguish a behavior next to you. <laughs> <laughs> that I reinforced here just not too long ago. Um, so everybody's commenting what a great topic and um, Shirley is local. She's got a question for you, Laura. Mm -hmm. um, what's the reason you can't take baby deer or can you now? Right. We took in baby deer, I think, for 17 years. We, we were able to rehabilitate fawns for 17 years. Uh, and then I think it was in 2009, the state pulled all fawn permits and nobody in the state is allowed to rehabilitate fawns. The reason that we were given was that uh, they were concerned about chronic wasting disease, said that some surrounding states had chronic wasting disease and the concern might be that- What is that? Somebody might, it's, a, it's a disease that deer get 
that um, it, it's basically kind of what it says. It, it causes their body to waste away and it can be spread throughout the herds. It can also be an issue sometimes for people if they're going to eat those deer, um, you know, for hunting. And we had a we have a healthy deer population in Ohio, so they didn't want people crossing the state lines with a fawn to get it to a rehabilitator in Ohio and then possibly bring that disease into the state. You know, we're, we're not allowed to cross state lines with mammals, but we're also relying on people to be honest about where they find things too. Yeah. Um, so that was the reason we were given, um, you know, it, deer were a, an interesting challenge when we used, when we used to take them in. Uh, the state has never allowed the rehabilitation of adult deer. And I agree with that. An adult deer that's injured badly enough that it's going to need daily care is going to panic and injure itself further in a captive situation. They're just a very high strung, dangerous animal when they're in a captive situation. But the fawns, um, the challenges when we used to do fawns was appropriate, you know, first of all, they imprint on people very easily. Uh, when we used to rehabilitate fawns, we had an enclosure where we'd get them used to a bottle over the first few days. And then after that, they were in an outdoor enclosure with a bottle rack and they never saw us. Um, but even then, you could still tell they were just a little more comfortable around people than a, a wild one would be, you know, one that had been raised by its own mother. So that was a, a little bit of a challenge. And then finding, you know, once a deer is old enough to be released, you know, we were lucky at our old location, we could release right on site because we were in a, a good area for that. But trying to transport them once they got old enough to be released was tricky, too. So there's a, there's a lot of challenges with doing fawns. But to be perfectly honest, I'd say that nine out of 10 phone calls we get on fawns aren't really orphaned. You know, the, mo the mother will leave that baby for hours and hours. Um, we had a call, I think it was a couple of years ago from somebody, there was a fawn on their porch curled up sleeping. And <clears throat> we said, <laughs> I know, I know, surprise. Um, and uh, we um, said, give it until tomorrow morning. And this was like, like at four o'clock in the afternoon. Give it until tomorrow morning. And sure enough, mom came back uh, late that night and and fed that baby and they off they went. Sometimes she'll leave them in the same place, come and nurse, go away, leave them. And for the first couple weeks of a fawn's life, they have no body odor. So predators can't sniff them out. So they know naturally, I mean, they know to just lay quietly and wait for mom to come back. Now, if somebody calls us and there's a fawn up walking around crying, might mean that something happened to mom and we might, you know, need to try to figure something out. But with, the, but now they do not allow us to rehabilitate them at all. <clears throat> there, there's a three day period where we can take them in and try to find a, a surrogate mother for them. But I know for us at Nature's Nurse, it's just not practical um, during the busy season to try to find a mother deer willing to take in the, you know, the orphan. Okay. Um, I know we have a couple different questions, but I mm -hmm. want to, can we address, um, you were talking about imprinting because that, uh, that has affected Willie. Yep. Um, can you talk about what imprinting is in the danger yep. and what it's doing not to help that animal's future? Yeah. So imprinting is when an animal usually, you know, from a baby is made to be comfortable around people. And so <clears throat> when we're raising baby animals, as cute as that little opossum is, uh, <laughs> he looks like a, like, um, <laughs> so we are very careful not to handle them any more than we absolutely have to, you know, sometimes even with baby fox, something like that, once we've got it eating on its own, when we move it to an outdoor cage, we actually try to scare them when we go into the cage so that they aren't likely to come close to us. Because imagine any of these animals, first of all, if they don't have that natural fear where whether it's people or a hawk flying overhead, if they aren't a nervous animal when they get released, they're probably not going to be out there very long. Um, so people who try to raise baby animals or even try to make the squirrels in their yard friendly enough to come up and eat out of their hand, not everybody's as nice as you. And if a squirrel approaches somebody, they may not be kind to that squirrel. Um, so it's really important that we enjoy wildlife wild. And, you know, yes, I love seeing the, 
the birds and the squirrels and the other animals that come out, you know, to the feeder in my backyard, but I don't want to try to get them so that they're coming up to my house or trying to approach me, that type of thing, because it's a death sentence for them eventually. Yeah. And um, tell me if I'm wrong, but does the... You're wrong. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> the story with Willie is... Um, we think she's an imprint, right? Yeah, they, she was at a rehabilitation center, but they didn't have any other vultures to put her with. And a lot of times rehabilitation centers work together. They'll call other facilities. And, you know, last year we had a, a baby fox and we weren't getting any others in. So we got it to Bruckner Nature Center, who then got it to somebody that they work with that was just doing fox. And then when that fox was uh, rehabilitated and ready, it got raised with others, we went and picked it back up and released it back to the area that it came from. So centers work together. In the case of Willby, they weren't having any luck finding um, other young vultures to put Willie in with. And so they did everything they could to not get her too comfortable around people. But uh, apparently twice they tried releasing her and she was found hanging out on children's playgrounds and kind of freaking people out a little bit. So um, can you imagine a, you know, a vulture that stands as tall as your child, you know, walking up to <laughs> walking up to your child. So, yeah, Willie was kind of a flunky. But I mean, that's the importance. I mean, there's physically nothing wrong with Willie and yet she can't. Right. She can't. Yeah. Yeah. She should be out there soaring and flying around with all the other vultures. But even with people who knew what they were doing. She ended up too comfortable around people to do well in the wild. And so you can imagine that for anybody from the general public that finds something, you can't you can't raise a, a baby animal and keep your hands off of it when it's the you know when it's a big exciting thing for you to be doing. Right. So it's important. Okay. Um, I wasn't. I thought Willie was taken in by an individual. Yeah. No, she was actually, and, and this you know goes to show that there's even even those of us that know what we're doing, if the circumstances end up being, you know not ideal, it can happen to people that are that are licensed and, and know and have been doing it for years. So that's why it's so important that people from the public don't try it on their own. Yeah, because um, you may think it's cute now, but when that animal's natural behaviors kick in and they're peeing or puking all over the place or you see uh, you can't afford the, the, the food that it really needs to survive, yeah. uh, you can't just release right. it. Well, you know, Lenny, the fox that we have out at Nature's Nursery, we're pretty certain he was probably one that was bred in captivity, sold to somebody, and then dumped eventually because they are, oh, they're adorable, but they are very hyper. They smell like skunk. They, you know, and so most people that go out and even buy those animals from licensed breeders, which sadly is legal in Ohio, um, a lot of those animals end up dumped out in the wild and not having a clue as to what to do. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay. I'm just going to come through and show a couple different photos. Um, this one, uh, somebody that has come here for workshops sent this to me. This is um, a baby screech owl. Um, Tis the season, right? Isn't it coming up? Oh, on yeah. The season? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Einstein has been uh, trying to mate with all of us these these last few days. So, I mean, the last few weeks. So, <laughs> in your screech owls, you have um, your screech owls. They're they're smaller. Right. So those of you that have seen Einstein, so people see an adult and think they're actually seeing a baby. Right. Um. So it's the it's the season for. I know I had experience and I got in touch with you <clears throat> about the screech owls when I lived at the other house that mm -hmm. uh, fell out of a nest um, during a storm and somebody had mm -hmm. found them underneath a bush with their cat trying to get to them. Right. Um, so it was interesting. So I mean, those birds were on the ground. Mm -hmm. Is that natural for them or no? Um, you know, it depends on their age. At a certain age, they will get out. They're called branchers. They'll be out on the branches kind of practicing and everything. And at that point, they may get down on the ground. But if they're younger than that, you know, and certainly, obviously, if they're the size of this little one there, um, not they shouldn't be out. And so but that doesn't mean that they need to come into a rehabilitation center. So they can be put back into the cavity that they came from. 
And that's and, exactly what you told me to do. I got a ladder, picked them all up, yeah. and stuck them back up in the tree. Right. And, you know, and sometimes if that can't happen, we will um, even put up a nest box and stick them in a nest box very nearby. And the mother hears their calls and starts going back to them there. And so there's a lot of options for these guys or other baby birds that we can get them reunited with their mothers. Yeah. And I just want to say this screech owl was not here at the Animal Behavior Center. That's not what we do. Um, this is, I just want to give correct credit to Erin Clauser. She uh, used to volunteer at the Medina Raptor Center. Um, so that's who that is. Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> what else, what other common calls do you get now um, about what different types of animals? What's the most common in misconceptions? Yeah. Well, the, the bunnies are definitely the most common that we get right now. The baby ducks will be the next. Some of the things that we'll be getting calls on coming up soon are going to be turtles, uh, specifically snapping turtles, but others. And it's really important if somebody sees a turtle crossing the road, if you're going to help it across the road, which, you know, just be careful if it's a snapping turtle. Um, if you're going to help it across the road, don't put it on the side of the road you think is best. Put it in the direction it was heading. Because a lot of these water turtles um, are heading away from water to go lay their eggs. And if you take them back to the water or to a totally different area, they could get egg bound because they're, they're waiting to lay those eggs and they don't lay them right near the water. They go away from the water to do that. So it's really important. And in the case of turtles like box turtles, they live their entire life in an area the size of a football field. And so if you take them someplace else, studies have shown that many of them die spending all of their time trying to get back to their known area. And so it's really important not to remove them from the area they came from in the case of the box turtles, especially. Yeah. And that's another case of, I know I talk about anthropomorphism a lot, putting um, human characteristics mm -hmm. or thoughts on animals. That's another area where anthropomorphism can kill. Just yes. because you think you know what the animal's thinking. Right. Um, yeah. So important. So important. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, what other animals? Um, we're going to be getting in baby opossums. So um, opossums are, for anybody that's not gotten a chance to, <laughs> I mean, who can, who can love that face? Um, these guys are one of my favorite animals. They are the only marsupial that lives in this country. They So they carry their babies in a pouch. And for the ladies out there, I think you should uh, look up to the opossum because she's only pregnant for 12 to 14 days. And then she has babies the size of a raisin. So um, I think she's, they're doing something right. And the thing is, they do carry their babies in a pouch. So if you see a dead opossum on the road, there might, even though the mother got killed, the babies may be alive in her pouch. Most of the baby opossums we get in come in from those circumstances. And there are people out there who will stop and check a baby, I mean, a mother opossum. And if there's babies in the pouch, we'll pull those babies out of the pouch and bring them to nature's nursery. And so these guys, they got, there's so many interesting facts about them. They only live to be one to three years old. They're not a, an animal that generally has a territory. They're nomads, so they move from place to place. They don't carry a lot of disease because their body temperature is too low to incubate disease properly. So not that they can't, but it's very unlikely that they're going to carry rabies or anything else. They um, don't gnaw on wood. They don't dig holes. Uh, yes, they will get into your garbage if given the opportunity because um, they like an easy meal just like anybody else. But they are there's just so many neat things about the opossum. And uh, I think uh, most people out at Nature's Nursery, it's it's one of their favorites out there. So, and, yeah. Uh, and we there was a group of us together the other day, and we were talking about opossums. And um, some people, some people just really they're like, oh, they're nasty, they're mean, yeah. they're ugly. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, they people don't like the naked tail, they're very rat like. They, um, but what I'll tell you is. Opossums are not an overly aggressive animal. They've got more teeth than any other mammal in North America, and they'll show them to you. 
And that's in the hopes of not getting into a conflict with anybody. If you walked out into your garage and there was an opossum in your garage, the first thing it's going to do is hiss and open its mouth and hope that you say, okay, and walk away. If you kept going closer, it would probably try to run away. If you cornered it, you might get bit because they have the possibility to do that. But if you made a loud noise, you've heard the term playing a possum. It's not something they consciously do. They literally fall over, start to drool, and ooze this green slime from a gland that they have that smells kind of dead. And it's so that animals that go after them won't want to eat them because they smell kind of rotten and decayed. And it works for them. And so they're not an animal that is that their first option is going to be aggression at, you know, at all. So they're an interesting animal. Um, Carrie also says they eat ticks too. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Huh? They eat lots and lots of ticks. So that's a good thing. We need some opossums around here. I know. I know. So um, what do, what do you suggest then, Laura, if people are finding nocturnal animals that are out during the day? Okay. It, it depends, you know, just like, we're diurnal animals for the most part, um, but I know I've gotten up in the middle of the night and nocturnal animals are going to get up in the middle of the day. So it's not an unusual thing for, you know, an opossum to be out during the day, especially depending on the season and that kind of thing. Um, but it's more how they're acting. If you know, I mean, I think they just had on the news in Ohio about zombie raccoons Uh <laughs> And it was, it was ridiculous. It was, it was probably raccoons that had distemper. And when they get distempered, they're off balance. They'll stand up sometimes on their hind legs and, and, you know, and maybe even drool a little bit and be very disoriented and, and approach people. It's because they've got distemper. And, and it can be in the eastern part of the state where there is raccoon rabies. It could be, it could be rabies. Uh, but that's what you have to look at. Not whether the animal is out during the day, but how it's acting. If it's out during the day and acting good and nervous and aware of its, sur its surroundings, that's perfectly normal. If it's staggering and walking um, like it doesn't know what's going on around it, then that's a sick, probably a sick animal. Okay. And uh, some people think of fox as nocturnal animals, which they are, but it's also not at all uncommon for fox to be out in the middle of the day. Um, there's people that have had fox lounging on their deck. Um, they hang out at golf courses all the time. And they are an animal that's kind of gotten very comfortable around people um, and adapted to the situations. I was going to say people, humans, are an invasive species. Right. So you're going to start seeing more mm -hmm. of these wild animals coming closer to us because they have no choice. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I got a phone call years ago from a new big housing development that went in. And the lady said, I just had a fox go through my yard. What's it doing in my yard? I and I said, it didn't take the bus to get there. You know, it lived there all along and you're now in its territory. And we're just going to, and that's a big part of what Nature's Nursery's mission is, is to get people to coexist with wildlife. We don't have to necessarily like everything that wildlife does. And I'm not expecting somebody who has a woodchuck burrowing under their house to just say, oh, that's okay. We're going to help them with situa the situation and try to get the animal to move on. But we do need to be understanding that we are sharing our world with a lot of different species and you might as well enjoy it because that's a lot better than trying to fight it all the time. Yeah. Um, and that's why what I say about um, a lot of people who call certain animals pests like the crows, mm -hmm. pets, um, the possums, the squirrels. And why are they considered pests is because um, they quickly outwit us. Exactly. That, that is They're the smarter than we are a lot of times. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, yeah. it's a matter, matter of perspective. If you were to go over to Africa, elephants are pests a lot of times. If you're somebody in Africa trying to raise your family and an elephant tromples your entire garden in a day, that's an animal who's a pest. But we want to save the elephants. And so it's a matter of perspective. So I think we have to be a little more understanding because most of us, you know, if the bunnies are eating our flowers, in our garden, or even if the raccoons are stealing the corn out of our vegetable garden and just at the last minute, I mean, believe me, I know my, I've had, you know, tomatoes where I've seen a little red squirrel go around and take a bite out of each one of my tomatoes, you know, just before I want to pick it, but I'm not surviving off of that food. 
And so, yes, it may they be are. a bit annoying that these animals are doing things that I don't like, but is it really, you know, being destructive to my life? And so we just really need to look at it all with a little bit of perspective. Yeah. Um, let's, um, let's see, we're almost up on the hour, but um, can we talk about one more thing? And Meredith is on here from the Lorain County Metro Parks which you saw her in level two the other day. Um, she just says a common one. If I pick up yeah. a baby bird, will the mom smell it on me? And yeah, I think she's uh, getting that question out there because she knows it's a good one. I have a feeling she knows the answer to that. Um, yes, it's, it's not true. In fact, in, the mo in most uh, cases, most birds have a very poor sense of smell. They don't know that you've touched that baby. And so, and yeah, even I, have to, I have to put up, yes. you know, talk about sense of smell and I put up a yeah, turkey. Yeah, yeah, the one that does have a good sense of smell. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, you know, even with the animals that do have a good sense of smell, like I said, they're hardwired to raise their young. They're not going to care. But in the case of birds, if a bird falls on the ground, a baby bird falls on the ground, if it is, should still be in the nest, if you can reach the nest, you can put it back in the nest. You might want to go wash your hands afterwards because sometimes they have little mites on them that you might not want crawling on you. Uh, if you can't get it back in the nest, we can give you suggestions for how to make a makeshift nest and the mother will still go back to them. And, and so there's lots and lots of options, but that old wives tale about the mother smelling it, it's just, it, yeah, it's, it's no good. I don't know what, you know, who came up with it, but it's no good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's, and that one is still so strong. You yeah, know, it is. wives' tale. Yeah. Um, okay, so how do people reach you? I have okay. a website here. Yeah, so our website is one way to do it, and that's natures-nursery.org. Our, our hotline, uh, that phone number is 419-877-0060, and there will be days in May, June, and July where we will take 300 phone calls a day. Um, and a lot of those, thank goodness, don't result in animals coming in. It's just people asking what's normal in their backyard. Um, and what so the phone number was again? It's 419-877-0060. And we also, you know, are happy to try to hook people up with other rehabilitators closer to them, too. Um, like I said, the rehabilitators in Ohio all work really well together and support each other. And so if uh, somebody's calling from another part of the state, we'll be glad to get them hooked up. They can also go to the um, Ohio Wildlife Rehabilitators website and um, their Facebook page to get information, too. And, um, about, and then our well, Facebook page is another another good way to connect oh, with us, too. Yeah. Yeah. Because you guys post a lot of po video yeah. photos on yes. Nursery's Facebook page. Mm -hmm. Where do people go that um, I know a lot of people on here are from different parts of the United States, even some outside of the country? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't have a, the websites memorized, but they can go to the National Wildlife Rehabilitators Association um, and they have listings of licensed rehabilitators all across the country and um, even, you know, into Canada and some other places, too. So, yeah, they can they can go there to check that out um, and that way that can hook them up with somebody that's close to them and they can talk about, you know, the details of whether that animal needs to come into that facility or not. Okay. Um, all right. With that being said, I mean, we could, I have a couple of different topics on, or questions on here. I didn't even get a chance to uh -huh. address. Um, I know there was something on there about some Eagles. Um, would you be interested in coming back on with us again in the future? Sure. Sure. I've, I've always got plenty to talk about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you guys, for those that don't know, um, Laura, um, I've been volunteering out at Nature's Nursery and still do for the past probably over eight years. Uh, Laura is the director of operations out there. And through my volunteering there, you've also become a very good friend. Um And this is who I train. Nature's Nursery is who I train. Uh, Willoughby the education turkey vulture for, and those that have seen um, Jefferson. He's doing guy, great. He's doing great. Jefferson's Good. Doing great. Yep. Good. Those of you who've seen Jefferson, uh, Mary Lou, the American crow, we were talking about bringing out uh, Sharon, the still hibernating. He's just, he's just waking up. So she's okay. just waking up now. So we'll, we'll let you know how that goes. <laughs> 
um, this is where I volunteer um, my training for. And um, in we were talking about having Einstein come back and visit you too. Yep, would would love that. Um, he is being highly requested around here. <laughs> and, um, I also want to state that I have a sub permit through Nature's Nursery. That's how I do what I do. Um, otherwise, it's illegal to do to take in these animals and train them, and not healthy. Right. <laughs> okay, Laura. Thanks for um, thanks for joining us. Sure. And yeah. Have you on again? And yeah, I'd love to. Gonna, what were you gonna say? Oh, I said love to. Yep, would love to have you on again. I'm just going to go through and recap a couple of upcoming events coming up. Um, I'll take you off screen if you want to okay. hang around for a minute. Hey, sounds good. Thanks, Laura. Yeah. Um, so those of you that watch our live streams, um, a lot of our live streams are very educational. Um, well, all of them are. Uh, we do talk a lot about uh, training, animal behavior, training and enrichment using applied behavior analysis and positive reinforcement. For those that are interested in learning more about us, you can visit our website. Um, that's the animalbehaviorcenter.com. And you can also find um, our level one memberships, live stream annual subscriptions are for companion animals, owners wanting to know more about using applied behavior analysis with animals. We have our level two, which is for which Laura belongs in um, or belongs to. It's more for people who want more intense uh, work with applied behavior analysis and animals, um, wildlife rehabbers, professional trainers, uh, zoo trainers. Um, we have several dog trainers in there as well. And then we have our species specific, which are the pig project and the parrot project, which the parrot project is doing phenomenal. That's where we're following and doing the, the work with Abby, the mutilating cockatoo. Um, so we've had several different people join just in this past week to know the steps we're taking and what we're doing. Um, just to give you, don't, re don't forget the first week in May, we're having our first ever, um, all species animal enrichment workshop, a two day hands-on, very interactive workshop. Um, in October, the second week, myself and Dr. Deb Jones will be giving our first ever presentation together on, um, all species animal training and behavior workshop, um, which that one is selling quickly. And then uh, join me in two weeks out at Best Friends Animal Sanctuary in Kanab, Utah, where the Pet Professional Guild is putting on a um, animal behavior and training summit. Um, so I'll be there in two weeks and I will be live streaming from there with an upcoming episode of Coffee with the Critters. All right, guys, um, feel free to get in touch with me or Laura if you have any questions. Um, on today's broadcast or any of, our, any of our content. I think Quincy's about had enough. All right, you guys, I'll see you next week. Coffee with the Critters. Take care. Thank you.